of God's creation. See the, the Great Lakes, see the, uh, you know, in Upper Michigan, the trees are ahead of ours, so there, there are a number of trees turning colors ahead of ours. Praise the Lord, we're not that far along, amen? <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a good thing that we, uh, that we know winter's coming. You know, we know winter's coming. That's a good thing that we know it. Because we can put an extra blanket on the bed. We can get ready. Well, well, here's something else. We know Jesus is coming. We know that he's about to return. We know that he has promised to take the church out. We know that. So we don't have to be surprised when it happens. The people who don't expect it, they're going to be surprised. But the church is not. The church knows it's going to happen. And the church is ready. We are ready. Amen. We are ready. Amen, church? Amen. Well, let's go ahead and, and release. Uh, if you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Release the kids? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to, thank you. We'll let the kids go with Miss Francis. Kids, kids, everybody stop, freeze kids, look at me, raise your right hand. I'll know which one's my right. Okay, well, just raise one of your hands and say, I promise to learn about Jesus. I promise to learn about Jesus. And have a good time doing it. And have a good time doing it. You're released, all right. I, I ate a ghost pepper last night. All right, adults, raise your right hand. Some of you, your other right hand. <laughs> Say, I promise to learn about Jesus. I promise to learn, learn about, about Jesus. Jesus. And have a good time doing it. And have a good, good time, time doing it. it. All right, you're not released. <laughs> not yet, you're staying right here. All right. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. You know, being in the house of God is a good thing. Yes, Amen. Uh, some people, they, they want to be belong to the church of the sour lemons. Because <laughs> they look like they sucked a bag of lemons to go into church. And they everything's sour and everything's wrong. And you know what? And why is that that, that people that want to crab and try always sound like that? <laughs> Instead of being filled with the joy of the Lord. We're filled with the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. Strength. That means we're strong. If the strength of the Lord is in us, we are strong. Say, I'm strong. I'm strong. You might want to help with somebody next to you and say, uh, get you some of that. Well, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, and if you recall, <clears throat> the last time we were together, we were looking at verses 7 through 10. That's what we're going to pick up uh, this week because there's a little bit more that we need to say about verses 7 to 10. Remember, in the first six verses, it said every Christian has a God-assigned ministry. Every Christian has a God-assigned ministry. Now, you might look around and say, well, gee, you know, I don't... I don't play drums or play guitars or play instruments or sing as well, or I don't I don't ush as well as others. <laughs> I, I don't know how to how to run a sound or video system. So how can I serve? You have a ministry in the house of God. Yes. You have a ministry. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the church coming together in ministry a little bit after the message. Because we have a big opportunity to really be the church to the community this coming Saturday. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I wanted to just point out those first six verses say you are called by God. You have a ministry. You, 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 don't, you don't just uh, become a Christian in a vacuum. You're part of a church. The great church of Jesus Christ. The body of Jesus Christ. Which means his power, his love, his life. Is flowing through you. Amen. Think about that. Wow, there's a there ought to be a vitality and a joy in us. Amen. 
And then it goes into verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Remember, we talked about uh, grace while we often know it as the, uh, the unmerited favor of God. It, we understand that it is that dimension or that part of divine activity, God's activity in your life and mine in the world that enables God to confront human indifference and rebellion. In fact, when people are running away from God or pretending God doesn't exist, oh my, that's when God rushes in with an inexhaustible capacity to forgive and to bless. In other words, God forgives us and extricates us, takes us out of our sin and puts us in a whole new place. That's what God's grace does. Amen. And so, so God is exercising in a divine, supernatural, and overwhelmingly powerful way, God is exercising his goodwill toward you and me. That's what he's doing. He, it's like he loves us so much he can't help himself. He just can't help himself but do good for you. Now, the, the, the really good part about that is we said... To each one of us, grace was given. It, it's, it started way back when, and, and it didn't just, well, here's one little thimble full, and that's all you get for the rest of your life. It started, it's like the floodgate was open back when you believed, even before that, but then it opened really when you believed, and it, and it just keeps flowing into your life. It just keeps on coming. And so, so we see that even in Hebrews 4.16, that grace comes when you need it most. Grace flows. When you need the most help, that's when God comes in. Amen. Grace is given in time of need. So, so all of this is measured out to you with, it says, the measure of Christ's gift. How does he give? We talked about that a little bit. How does he give? Does he give with a thimble? Does he give with a teaspoon? Remember I told you about that game? Some of you wanted to play that game where we put a bowl of water on one end and an empty glass on the other, run back and forth and try to fill up your glass. Um, that's not how Christ gives, with a little teaspoon or, or a little thimble. Or a tiny, tiny little measure. His, his measure. What's his measure? Well, we saw that in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Exceedingly abundantly. You know, during the summertime when it, it's like, you know, you have, uh, here in Minnesota, we have winter and construction, the two seasons of the year. You know, uh, <clears throat> I once had, well, in fact, more than once, but I once had uh, a windshield uh, broken severely because there was a dump truck that was way too over full of gravel that they were digging out somewhere. And it was piled up, piled up, piled up, and they even had sideboards on the top, and it was piled up above the sideboards. And they're supposed to put that thing over the top to keep them from flying out. And, uh, well, why do that? That takes time. So he's bombing down the road, and I'm driving. Actually, and all of a sudden, a bunch of gravel fell off. And because of the speed, the gravel was bouncing higher than my car. Where am I going to go? And <clears throat> all this gravel onto my windshield, and I had a broken windshield. Just like that. You see, but God's abundance... Is to overflowing. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't break you. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, tear up your windshield. God's exceeding. That's what it says. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ah, uh, man, it showers you. It it overwhelms you. It's like a tsunami of grace that comes to you and gives you everything you need for life and life abundantly, exceedingly abundantly. That those are words that are used to say. 
you can't measure it. You can't measure it. So, so we looked at the measure. The measure is given according to Christ's measure, not according to your measure. You know, there are people who, you know, they'll look at, they'll look at Gabriel and say, boy, if it was up to me, you'd get about three quarters of a, of a whiff of grace. That's it. You know, some people want to judge like that, but God doesn't give according to your measure or someone else's measure. Even if somebody says you don't deserve it, the answer is, I know. I don't. I don't deserve a thing God gives me. But you know what? That's the nature of our God. Because then when he gives, it's exceedingly abundantly. And, and the, the really good thing is that uh, even if you don't think that God will give you much of anything, God still gives you grace. Even if you don't think that you deserve or are worthy of anything, God still gives you grace. That's the good news. Because, because we think we're not worthy. We think we're not very well esteemed. We think uh, God doesn't uh, or shouldn't care for us. But he does. He can't help himself. He loves us so much, he goes after us. You know, I used to preach for years. God's not out to get you. But God is out to get you. God has launched an all-out search across time and space to find you, to get you, to hunt you down and cover you with his grace. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to hurt you. He wants to bless you. That's what he's doing. So then we get to uh, the next verse that says, therefore, verse 8, therefore, because God's grace comes to you, because God's grace is measured out to you so exceedingly, abundantly, generously. Because Christ is the one who gets to choose how much grace you get. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, uh, that's powerful. That's a powerful statement. That comes from Psalm 68, 18. When he ascended on high, when did, when did Jesus ascend on high? 50 days, 40 days, I should say. 40 days after his resurrection. He ascended. And at that point, it says he led captivity captive. The word captivity is the word that we would use for prisoners of war. That's what it is. Prisoners of war. He led prisoners to freedom out of captivity. Now, the, the, the good news about that is having rescued them, then uh, that means that they're free. Correct? Amen. If, you, if you're rescued, then you're free. Now, we think about that. Um, if he led the prisoners out of the prison camp, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of captivity were they in? I just want to show you a, a picture. This is a, an archaeological excavation of the Philippian prison in which Paul and Silas were held. This is where uh, archaeologists believe they were held at the, at the actual cell. Now, of course, the wall is fallen down because they, they excavated it. But this was all subterranean, all underground. So let, let's just look this up once. I, I want to get a picture of that jail cell. Turn back with me, if you would. Uh, turn back with me to Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And by the way, Janet, do we have the recording started there? The, the, the recorder? Got it? Just need to start. 
start and then hit the red dot and it will start recording. Power is on the side. Got it? All right, thank you. All right, we're in Acts 16, verse 16. I'm, I'm going to read this, but then comment because I want you to get, sometimes we read these Bible stories and we don't always think about the real human element that went on, okay? Now, when it happened, now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. So wherever they went, this woman followed along with yelling at people. Now, you say, well, why wouldn't that be a good idea? That, wouldn't that be good? If she was saying, hey, they're, they're talking about the ways of God. But what she's doing or she has a spirit of divination. That is a demonic spirit. Yes. Yes. So she's going around warning people to watch out for these guys lest you get religion. That's kind of how that's presented. Yeah. Yeah. We saw that on one of our mission trips when we were in Skid Row uh, down in, uh, in Los Angeles one time. Uh, there was one, one of the women walked literally about 10 to 15 feet in front of us. Oh, these people are preaching Jesus. These people are preaching Jesus. Watch out, they're preaching Jesus. And everybody was like, oh yeah, forget it. No, I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. Finally, one of the homeless guys went, hey, come on over here and give me a hug to the woman. And she came over to give him a hug and he hugged her and then like, Go on by, go on by. And we went fast. Our group went fast. And he started talking. Pretty soon he turned her away from us and walked her in the other direction. So we had a brother in Christ who turned that woman and that spirit away. The same spirit that Paul dealt with. Trying to turn people away from hearing the gospel. And that's what she was doing. But Paul, verse 18, verse 18, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, notice he didn't chew the woman up and spit her out, said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Here's the deal, folks. Uh, as long as we don't interfere with the money-making and power capabilities of the people around us who don't believe, we, we, they don't care if we do church. But as soon as we start calling people to repentance and they stop drinking and they stop buying drugs and they stop buying the things from the from the places uh, that that hurt them and their families and their relationships when when it starts cutting into their profit now suddenly they have a problem with the church I'm telling you we're living in a day when if we will live right before God and call people to repentance in and through Jesus Christ, there are going to be people in the world who are under the influence of the prince of the power of the air who are not going to like us anymore as the church. They saw that their hope of profit was gone and they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they, verse 20, they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. 
and they teach customs that are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. In other words, they're Jews, we're Romans, and they play the race card. They play the anti-Semitic card. And, and they don't want them anymore. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes, not their own clothes. They tore the clothes off of Paul and Silas. And they commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now, we had a case about 15, 20 years ago where an American young man was caned in a foreign country because he, he stole. And he was caught and he was caned. He was given so many stripes with a, with a bamboo pole. Now, they were commanded, they, they tore off their clothes and they were commanded to be beaten with rods, verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely, and having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, we think of stocks as those wooden things that close, you know, with your feet sticking out, but in fact, they would have been like manacles or shackles that were bolted or attached to either a rock or a large log or beam so that they would just shackle you in. Now, think about this. Many stripes with rods, with your clothes ripped off. You probably had two guys, one on each side, beating alternately. And they would beat them because they didn't want to hit them in the neck or the head they would beat basically from the shoulder blades, and often they would make them kneel down so that they could beat even the bottoms of their feet. Now, could you imagine being beaten from your shoulder blades to the soles of your feet, and being beaten and beaten and beaten? Then you're dragged into a prison but not just in the prison, you're taken down into what we would call solitary confinement. And I want you to look at this picture again and just look. There's no bathroom in there. Could you imagine being beaten with rods and then being thrown into a sitting position on a rock similar to what you see there, with your feet sticking out, and then having your ankles or legs clamped into position. You're not the first one in there. So you can imagine, you can imagine what that cell smells like, because there's no running water, and there's no bathroom. So they were sitting, for a very long time. How do we know it's a long time? Because the very next verse, verse 25 says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I've often thought, why would the prisoners listen to them? Or wouldn't somebody else, would you shout out, quit your singing? No. They probably had not one word of hope in that prison at all. And now suddenly, suddenly, you have somebody singing. We have, uh, we have examples of hymns in some of Paul's epistles where it just claims the glory of Jesus Christ and how gracious our God is in sending Jesus to us and how our sins are forgiven. So they're hearing the gospel in song. But imagine how painful and how smelly and how hopeless it is. 
But even with that, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. How many of us, having been falsely accused, having been uh, falsely chastised, beaten with rods, and then thrown into solitary confinement, how many of us would be going, oh God, help me. But that's not what they were doing. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loose. Can you imagine everybody in the prison? All doors just go, and they're open. All chains just go, and they're off. And everybody that was in the prison, uh, you, you think about it, why didn't they all get up and run out? Well, Paul and Silas were men of honor. They were men of honor. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open and supposing the prisoners had fled, he thought they had run away. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because it was a mandatory sentence of death for any guard that let prisoners escape. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Imagine, the guy who locked him in solitary, he cares enough about to say, don't hurt yourself. Why? Because then immediately, the man calls for light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why did he ask that question? The reason he asked that question, he was probably hearing the hymns and the songs and the prayers as well. And he realized there was hope outside that prison. He realized that even inside the prison, you can be free. You can be locked up tighter than a drum and still be free in the spirit. He realized he was more of a prisoner in that place than Paul and Silas, whom he had locked up. He wanted the freedom that they had. He wanted the saving that they had. He wanted the God that they had. Yes, yes. Amen. And so he said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that hour of the night, washed their stripes, Immediately, all of him and his family were baptized. And when he had brought them into his house, he probably lived somewhere in the upper parts of the prison. So he brought them up to his house. He set food before them. When was the last time they ate? Who knows? And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Now, there's more to that story, and we're not going to read the whole thing. I just wanted you to look at this picture and think that that's the spot. Could you imagine having been beaten from shoulder blades to, to soles of your feet and then being thrown down on a rock ledge or on the rock floor and having your feet chained? And that, you can't move. You can't get up. You can't stand up. You can't go anywhere. That's where you're going to stay, no matter how painful, no matter how bad it is, no matter how many rats run over you, uh, that's where you are. Now, that is simply, that is simply nothing more than a human prison. That's what that is. That's a human prison. But this, we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 4 here. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, when he talking about Jesus Christ, ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He led the prisoners out of their prison. Well, if, if we can look at this and say, boy, that is a, that's a pretty serious human prison. What was the prison like that these spirits were in before Jesus Christ? What, what kind of what kind of prison are people being led out of in the spirit when Jesus leads captivity captive? 
when you think about it, that's a, that's a pretty serious thing. We think about Jesus ascending on high. He led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men, it says in verse 8. He ascends from the place where he led those prisoners on a jailbreak, hell itself, and he ascended to a cleaner, purer, and more wholesome environment than the squalor of hell. I mean, you think in a human prison, most human prisons are pretty bad? Imagine how much worse hell is. But then, contrast that with heaven where God is. Revelation chapter 4 describes the vision John saw of the heavenly realm that's filled with color and light and beautiful singing and the, the various creatures that you see, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the angels that you can't really even count, and then the, the, the crystal sea which is the saints of God, and you have the, the smoke of the incense that are, uh, that are the prayers of the saints. Saints that are rising right to God's throne. Uh, there's thundering. There's lightning. There's this, this beautiful green rainbow. I guess we, we think of a rainbow as the multicolored, but it, it says it's, it's an emerald rainbow. So we think of the purity. Well, you, you know when you step outside sometimes, it, ah, you smell the beautiful air. Some people think country air doesn't smell so good, especially if hay is drying. Some people, oh, chew, you know, they start sneezing. Or, or you go out in the spring of the year when the farmers are spreading uh, liquid fertilizer. <laughs> say that. You know, you drive past that, you go, ah, to a farmer, that smells good. Uh, to anybody else that's like, ew. <laughs> but in heaven, you don't get those smells. When you breathe the air in heaven, it is so crystal clear. It is so pure that it's almost a sweet fragrance because it's the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's where God is. Now, we may not have been thus far Locked in hell like those people that Peter tells us from the days of Noah but have been waiting. Those spirits have been waiting and then Jesus led them out. But if you just, right there in Ephesians, just go back to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And just make a quick assessment of what your spiritual condition was like before it says you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins you were dead you once walked according to the course of the world you once walked according to the course of the prince of the power of the air you once were at the mercy of the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience that, that means you were a son of disobedience uh, you, you, were, you were one uh, who conducted yourself in the lust of your flesh. You fulfilled only the desire of your flesh, the desire of your mind. And you were by nature a child of wrath. That's who you were. I mean, that's the prison that you were in. But then look at verse 4. Oh, praise the Lord for verse 4. Praise the Lord for what Jesus Christ did in our lives. Praise the Lord that God didn't leave us in that mess. It says, but God. And whenever God comes in and enters your business, something is going to change. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding, there's that word again, exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That means that you have been raised to life, it says. You've been raised up with Christ. You've been seated in the heavenly. In the heavenlies, where is Jesus seated? At the right hand of power of God. That's where we're seated. And there's no time limit on that. In the ages to come, Jesus is going to point at you and say, there's one of my examples. You might think, oh, I'm not all that good. I haven't done that much for God. And yet Jesus is going to point to you and say, that's my example. That's my guy. That's my girl. Because you're a shining example. And he's just going to show his glory through you. That's what he's doing now. And then for all eternity, into the ages of the ages, he's going to keep pointing at you as a fine example of what he's done. So even though all those things were true about us, none of them are true now. None of them are true now. We're not dead. We're not under Satan's power. We're not living according to our own lusts. We're not, we're not, we're not. We are saved by grace through faith. And, and that's why it says in, uh, in chapter 4, it says that this, he ascended, verse 9, what does it mean but that he also first descended? So he came, he came to save us. He who descended, verse 10, is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens. But wait a minute, that means there's more than one heaven? Yeah. Heavens. Multiple levels of heaven, if you will. And he is above them all. And we're seated with him. What a place to be. What a, what a comparison. What a contrast to go from the squalor and the filth and the smell and the death of that prison to the glories of the heavens with Jesus Christ. When you think about that, that's really powerful. And then the last few words of verse 10, that he might fill all things including you. Jesus fills you. Jesus lives in you. If you put your faith in Jesus, he's in you. And if he's in you, then his power is also in you. And you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Amen. You can do. And greater is he who is in you than he who's in the world. That means if the world tries to overcome you and take you down, they're going to fail. The world's going to fail. The devil is going to fail. The, the powers that be out there are going to fail. They can't win because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Say it. I win. I win. Say it. I won. I won. Say I am victorious. I am victorious. Because God gives me the victory. Because God gives me the victory. Amen. So... So what's the good word for today? Stop looking back at your old life. Stop looking back at what you used to do. Stop looking back at that prison cell as if it was a good place to be. You don't need the smell and the confinement and the pain and the struggle when you have all of the heavens as your possession. Stop looking back as if sin is something desirable. Live life with the grace that God has poured into you with exceeding abundance. Know that the power of sin in you is broken. It's broken. And God's resurrection power flows through your veins. His power is your power. His life is your life. 
His righteousness is your righteousness. His riches are your blessing. His grace is given to you in your time of need. His gifts are your help reinforcement. Everything that he has is yours. So don't believe the lie that you would have more fun in prison. You won't. You absolutely won't. You couldn't handle it when you were there before. You sure aren't going to like it now that you've tasted freedom in Jesus Christ. Yeah. With God, you have more life. You have it more abundantly. You have more strength. You have more beauty. You have more joy. You have more fellowship. Plain and simple, brother, sister, you have more grace. You have more grace. And God can't help himself from coming and giving it to you more and more with exceeding abundance. Will you receive it? Amen. Will you receive it? Yes. Will you receive it? Well, this morning, we're going to receive communion. But as we're preparing to receive communion, we're also going to prepare uh, to receive our tithes and offerings. So, ushers, if you would come, come on up. And if you need an envelope, just put a hand up. And uh, the ushers will make sure you get one. receive them, we thank God for them, we receive them, and, and what we do as we receive them, then we live like, like they're ours, and we obey God, we do what God tells us to do, yes we do, and part of what God tells us to do is to, is to tithe, now, I know that many of us know what that is, Tithing simply is, a, is an old word that means one-tenth goes right off the top to God. So, so we, we tithe. If, if all Christians in America would tithe, do you know we could, we could wipe out homelessness? We could build a house for every homeless person in America. We could feed every hungry child in America. If every Christian would tithe, in the United States of America, we would have no more homelessness, homelessness, or no more hunger. Because we would have enough to take care of that. But even more than that, it's not just about building houses or putting clothes on people's backs or putting food in their belly. It's about feeding people's hearts and souls. It's about, it's about touching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And preaching the gospel is expensive. It is an expensive thing to do. Uh, play the second song, please. As we as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings, I want you to make sure that you declare over it. That this is going into God's house. It is not simply to fill physical needs. It is to preach the gospel. Every ear will hear. Every heart will be touched. Every nation shall hear. That Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. From this place out. The light will shine, and we will see that it happens. 
by the giving of these tithes and offerings. We declare it to be so in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that you come forward to deposit your tithes and offerings into the brown baskets on either side of the pulpit here. As you come forward then, in the white and gold basket in front, you will find sealed uh, communion elements. Take one for yourself back to your seat, and we will receive together. So church, we worship God by the giving of our tithes and offerings. So would you come, church? Would you come? 